Uh, good morning, and um, thank you for coming this morning. Um, Mario gave me the task of speaking about systolic and diastolic heart failure stages A through D in 15 minutes. Uh, so uh, you can imagine my enthusiasm when he asked me to speak on this. But I think what I'm going to do is try to bring this home to you um, by asking you to put yourself in my shoes with, these, with this one patient in particular I'll discuss. Really, the focus will be on the management uh, of the patient. So if you're a nurse, a primary care physician, hospitalist, cardiologist, try to put yourself in our shoes and manage these patients with us, OK? Um, no uh, conflicts of interest disclosed. So Mario already alluded to this. The magnitude of the problem is immense. We know that 1 to 2% of the population has heart failure. The prevalence is increasing, partly because of the increasing age of the population. The incidence is increasing, I should say. The cost is immense. And the prognosis, even though we've made great progress, uh, is still uh, quite dismal. So prior to 1980, your five-year mortality if you had heart failure was approaching 70 percent. And nowadays, with all our state-of-the-art therapies, we're still right around 50 percent. So in those patients who are hospitalized in particular, we can all think of those, if you have mild to moderate symptoms, your one-year mortality is 10 to 20 percent. And if you have severe symptoms, you have a 50% chance of being alive at one year. This is a remarkably uh, catastrophic disease. For decades, we've used new, the New York Heart Association class uh, to help us in our management of patients. And, and we all know this uh, classification quite well. It's quite intuitive and very useful because it has prognostic value. We know that class one, is asymptomatic, class four has severe symptoms at rest. Two and three are in between. And so the pros, again, are that's very easy to think of and use, and it actually has clinical value. The cons is that, and about a decade ago, heart failure community started saying this really focuses on symptoms and not the pathophysiology. So how can we turn this around and focus on the pathophysiology? And again, this is about management, so we won't go through details, but we know there are many uh, potential uh, causative mechanisms that lead to this problem. But at the top would be an insult, whatever insult you can think of, whether it's hypertension or chemotherapy. And the idea is to intervene at the very top before LV systolic dysfunction ensues. If it does ensue, that goal would be to intervene before symptoms develop. And in trying to accomplish this, we know that we still have limited tools to accomplish this goal. Sympathetic nervous system with beta blockers, and of course, angiotensin, uh, uh, renin angiotensin system with ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And the, new the newcomer would be aldosterone antagonists. So we'll talk a little bit about how these are being used. So based on this idea to intervene with pathophysiology, the new classification stages patients at either A, B, C, or D. And the idea is to intervene at stage A before uh, when they're at high risk, treat the hypertension, avoid the complications of the insult to the myocardium. Furthermore, if you do have developed asymptomatic heart failure, intervene early. Stage C and D are the symptomatic patients, but really we should list it like this because the vast majority of patients are going to be A and B. Uh, one slide or two slides on stage B heart failure. You should know that this is four times as great as the number of patients in C and D. So it's a huge population. Uh, the main contributors are coronary artery disease and hypertension. And to me, it's striking when you look at these survival curves. And take a moment to look at these survival curves. These are asymptomatic patients. Um, there at the bottom is systolic heart failure, so they're symptomatic. But look at moderately to severe asymptomatic LV dysfunction and how close a curve is to those that are symptomatic. It's a striking disease. Even mild LV dysfunction, quite striking uh, impact on survival. So not to go through the trials, but very few studies have actually studied, studied asymptomatic LV dysfunction. But sufficient to, to, for us to know that we know that ACE inhibitors and beta blockers help. If you can't take an ACE inhibitor, ARBs. And, and this is something that we've been practicing and known for years. 
Uh, we know that there is no role for digoxin and aldosterone antagonists in asymptomatic LV dysfunction, at least currently. And in terms of ICDs, it's a class one indication for ischemics, but really it's a class 2B indication for non-ischemics. And that means that there isn't that much data to support the use, though it's not contraindicated. It's not a class three, you can do it, but you have to think about it. Discuss with the patient and be frank about the pros and cons. Okay, the newest guidelines in 2012, there's been an update that CRT is now actually indicated, it's a 2B indication for ischemics, EF less than 30%, left on the runs block, QRS greater than 150. Very narrow population for asymptomatic LV dysfunction and um, cardiac resynchronization. Okay, but the rest of the time I want to spend talking about um, really say CND. And though it's a smaller population, this is where the bulk of our money goes. This is where the money's spent. And these are the patients that are, um, I think, uh, present quite a challenge. So this is a patient, a real patient, the data is real, the numbers are real, and again, let's work through it together and see what you would have done in each of these steps. So a 48-year-old gentleman, attorney, hypertension, moderate, al moderate alcohol intake, developed gradual onset dyspnea for three weeks. He presented to an outside hospital with bilateral pneumonia, right upper quadrant tenderness and a thickened gallbladder. He was diagnosed with cholecystitis, and because he looked so sick, they decided to do a percutaneous cholecystostomy rather than a cholecystectomy. Shortly thereafter, hemodynamic collapse, echo was done, EF was 20%, very dilated, RV was down to 25%, moderate regurgitation. His pH was 7.08, he had diminished urine output, he started on CVVHD or dialysis for two days, uh, and had a coronary angiogram, coronaries were clear, balloon pump was placed, We'll put on three uh, pressors or, or uh, inotropes and sent to UCLA for urgent heart transplant and VAD evaluation. This is what he looked like when he came in. Uh, the exam, as you can tell, is realistic because it's difficult. Uh, he came on levo, dopamine, dobutamine, amio, versed, durosamide. He's intubated, he's responsive. Um, his um, maps with the balloon pump were about 80, heart rate was 87. Difficult to assess is JVP, balloon pump, ventilated, can't hear an S3 gallop, I'm sorry. Uh, he had slightly cool extremities, and his labs showed evidence of shocked liver with slightly elevated T billy, uh, creatinine 1.8, falsely down because of dialysis, and negative toxicity and a white count of 18. So, right now, this is like what ST elevation MI is for uh, interventionalists. This is our ST elevation MI. This is when we start salivating and get really excited when this patient is coming over and we're there at two in the morning as they're coming and the nurses all know this, right? So the real question is, what are you gonna do when this patient hits the door, okay? And, but before we go there, how would you stage this patient? Is this stage C or D? Obviously it's not A or B. Well, you know, the reality is that stage D is end stage, meaning that you can't go backwards in the new classification. You can't call somebody D and then make them a C later. So this is one, you know, one nuance that if you say this is stage D, I'm committing them to transplant, you've determined their end stage. And so who would say that this is stage D? It's hard to say. I'd say you're meeting them for the first time, stage C, on their way to D, right? So, but practically, you have to make some decisions to make. Okay, do you put a PA catheter? Is there data to support putting a PA catheter? So based on the escape trial, would this patient benefit from a PA catheter? What do you guys think? So escape trial, they looked at 400 plus patients, they randomized them with or without PA catheter. And I'll give you a, the, the answer is that there was no difference managing with and without a PA catheter. So is it gonna help you to put a PA catheter in? And really the, the answer is, is it doesn't apply, okay? This trial does not apply to this patient because the exclusion criteria excluded patients who were in cardiogenic shock with creatinines that were failing on high dose inotropes. This is not the patient that you're being academic about. You need all the data you can get in this patient. So he did have a right heart catheterization and it's really useful to actually see the data. And actually to the credit of the referring docs, they put this in before he came, okay? But the data was RA was 21, PA pressures 47 over 20, weds of 27, cardiac output of 3.5, improved with inotropes. So now the question that we have to deal with is, he's hitting your door, should you immediately go to LVAD implantation? 
Newman's in the aud audience. He's shaking his head no. He said it's a bad idea. So what do you guys think? That's why he was sent. Do we send him for all that? And Newman's saying no. And, and the reason is, is you know, there's a lot of risk factors here. Okay. Number one, he's Intermax level one, which is a crashing and burning patient. And we know just from experience and kind of looking at the registries, patients with class, level one don't do, they do, you can get them through, but their outcomes are going to be worse. Um, so the answer is, eh. but on top of that, he's got a bunch of risk factors that make this very high risk. His CVP to WES pressure ratio is greater than 0.63, meaning the RA is not doing well. Uh, his RV stroke work index was less than 300, shock liver, three inotropes, elevated white count, possible infection, renal failure, ventilated. There's more risk factors here. This is not somebody you want sent to the, for all that time, but you do want to call your surgeon, get him on the phone at two in the morning and say, this is a guy who might, we may need to put on ECMO tonight, right? You are thinking ahead. And if you're going to use a support device, it better be biventricular rather than isolated LVAD. So, the patient was actually weaned off levofed. The butamine was switched to milorinone. He was cardioverted for a flutter. Balloon pump was weaned. Nitroprusside was added for afterload reduction. He had an improvement in his cardiac output. Captopril was up titrated to 100 Q6 hours, um, followed by the addition of hydralazine and isoload. This is a patient who likes afterload reduction. They don't all like afterload reduction, but this patient did. And, you know, this is what he looked like on minimal amounts of milorinone before the PA cath was removed. Not so bad. Index is low, but you got his wedge down, RA's down. This is somebody who's on a lot of medicine and a lot of afterload reduction, and you're feeling pretty good about it. Okay, started carvedilol law once the milorinone was on. He's diarrhea is about 20 liters in about 10 days. So now his labs are okay. These are, these are his medications at the time of discharge. Captopril, he's not African-American, but you can still use hydralis and nicerdil for afterload reduction if, you, if it's beneficial. Um, amiodarone for his flutter, a little bit of carvedilol, digoxin for symptomatic heart failure, Coumadin for his atrial fibrillation, voriconazole because he grew out some aspergillus, and furosemide for the congestion. So the question for you is, would you start this person on an LDOS or an antagonist? Which one and why? I'll give you a minute. Got it. And, Three major trials. We all know that Rails trials showed in severe class three, class four symptom, symptomatic patients, clear benefit for spironolactone. Ephesus was post MI, um, also beneficial, but this is EF less than 40%, I believe. Emphasis of heart failure was a player known in a less symptomatic heart failure population, stage two. But look at the inclusion criteria, very restrictive. So we are moving towards using it in less symptomatic patients but still with some restrictions in terms of how we use it. Okay, so do you have an answer? Well, the answer is here. You have to know that spironolactone and plurinone are different. A plurinone is, yes, very specific. You get less gynecomastia if you're a male, which is cool. Uh, <laughs> if you, if you, uh, but you, they're both metabolized through the liver, but a plurinone is metabolized through uh, cytochrome P450-3A4 uh, isotype, or isoform excreted renally, and you have to know the drug interactions because CYP3A4 inhibitors like voriconazole will raise your levels of a plurinone. So this person would have not done well on plurinone because of the way, because he was also on voriconazole for the aspergillus. So you're always thinking about drug-drug interactions when you're adding these medications and saying, why shouldn't I give this drug? Okay, at the time of discharge, EF is 19%, LVDD is 72%, a little out of SVT, but not a big deal. QRS is narrow. Should he get an ICD? No. Yes, no, maybe. He's a young guy, he's a lawyer. Yes. <laughs> oh. Okay, all right, I, I didn't say that, did I? No, okay. All right, so, so the answer is, is you know, it, in the media there's this, uh, not in the media, but in JAMA in 2011, there was this paper published on the inappropriate or non-evidence-based ICD implantations in the US, and you can see the greatest rate, this is like 23% of ICDs were non-evidence-based. And the greatest one was patients who had been diagnosed with heart failure less within three months, meaning you have to give medical therapy a try to see if there's a reversal process. So uh, we did send him home with a life vest because uh, I was nervous sending him home with, you know, EF of 20%. Uh, he didn't discharge, and three months later he's on go meds. His EF is 25%. We exercised him. His VO2 max is excellent at class one. So. Does he have a class 1, 2A, 2B, or 3 indication for an ICD? 
Who says class one? Two? Three? Okay, the answer is that it's a 2B indication, as we talked about. Asymptomatic, left LV dysfunction, non-ischemic, it's a 2B indication. And he's not completely reversed, but he's maybe getting better. So we talked about it, and you have to have a frank discussion and say, well, do you want this or not? He actually wanted to wait a little longer. He said, let's, we decided together, along with the referring doc, let's wait three more months. And, you know, three months later, his EF is 35, six, at six months, 35 to 40%. He's asymptomatic. And again, going back to what works, stop the hydrolysis in the ice He's a little dizzy. Um, stop the amiodarone, no proven <coughs> benefit here. Continue the Coumadin because he has two risk factors for stroke. And, you know, we actually are off diuretics at this point. Okay. Two years later, this is where he's at, 44%, VO2 max of 31, which is better than most of us, uh, exercising every day. You know, three years later, and this is the truth, I asked him, just, you know, he comes in, you're trying to do something better. I'm like, so how's your sex life? He's like, I haven't had sex in three years. And, and, and so I was like, ah, oh, you know, and, and, and so, you know, you, you know, you know, so obviously there's more to life than in your heart associations in class, right? So, you, you know, you prescribe sildenafil and remind myself to remind all of you to ask about the difficult questions that we often don't. And so common coexisting conditions, think about them, depression, sleep apnea, AFib, respiratory, sleep apnea, etc. So there's a lot of things that you really need to ask about in a heart failure population. Okay, four years later, he's exercising, working full time, and uh, actually this is not made up. This last week, I got a call that he had sudden death. Uh, absolutely true. I'm not making it up. It was uh, one of the hardest calls to get. So, you know, four years into this, he's doing really well. Got up, you know, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little choked up, but he gets up regular morning and he collapses. Uh, autopsy was not performed, but, you know, I think it gets to the heart of what we're trying to do, which is it's really hard to predict uh, and change the survival curve of this disease. You know, no matter how meticulous you are, how many conversations you have, you're trying to do the best you can, but you can't save everybody. And that's devastating. You know, it's, it's just really eats at you because you're trying to do the right thing and apply guidelines. And I'm like, oh, he had a 2B indication at three months. Should I have done, you know, who knows why he died? Could have been something else besides arrhythmia. But, you know, it's a team effort and it's a personal decision to, to you know, you have to empower patients to make these decisions. So uh, you have to have open discussions about what their survival curve looks like. You know, we can't uh, change the natural history of a disease, as ver at least very much. Okay, there's some help. You can go onto the Seattle Heart Failure uh, website and punch in a bunch of data and give you one, three, five year survival curves. That's helpful. There's, it, I don't really do that. Uh, you, you can, it can help you, but there's really a gestalt that you get from meeting patients. There's a, mon a bunch of risk stratification models, but this is a simple one in patients who are hospitalized. If you look at these three factors, you can predict quite well who's going to die. Um, so um, I, I bring this up just to say start thinking about the survival curves and how we can alter them and also who's at risk. Finally, um, the take home points I would say, titrate your medicines to target doses. This is probably one of the biggest mistakes I see in our heart failure clinic is that we're not titrating to the target doses. Evidence-based use of devices. There's new updates for CRT. I don't have time to go through them, but it's worth looking them up. Uh, treat comorbid conditions. Refer if red flags arise. These are the red flags that you can think of. Recurrent hospitalizations, ICD firings, unintentional weight loss, renal dysfunction, class three or four symptoms, intolerance of medications, hyponatremia, elevated, persistently elevated BNP, low cholesterol. These are bad signs. Please refer them early. Uh, Paleo care, we're not going to talk about it, but this is not hospice. We need to, we are wasting way too much money in end-stage heart failure, is my opinion, way too much. We have to identify patients who are not candidates for advanced therapies. That's a hard thing to do. It took me about five or six years to really get comfortable with that, but it's important. And lastly, um, none of our therapies impact heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And that's all I'm going to say about heart failure with, pres uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It's uh, and I'll stop there and then I thank you for your attention.